so last day with Bernie's days, and then next time we're going to be moving on to uh, things fall apart. Um, how did this last bit go for you? Okay, yeah, there's not a lot of joy to be found in this book, right? It's a pretty, it's a pretty bleak view of humanity generally. Does anybody come out of this looking good? No. Maybe Elizabeth. Maybe. Well, the, she comes out, of, she seems to enjoy the best fortune, right? <laughs> but does she come out of this looking like a good, like, looking like someone whose life the novel endorses? You uh, had a strong reaction to that, Dee. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, no, I'm with Lindsay. I still don't like her. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean, she she probably got the best. She probably got the best. I don't get it either. I guess she was just a mean person and looked good. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, people certainly aren't rewarded for virtue, no, right? No, definitely not. Um, yeah, and any um, rewards that people receive are not connected to uh, their actual um, achievements or goodness as human beings, right? Yeah, because look at Dr. Veer Swami. How uh -huh. he turned out. He was probably one of the only decent people in the whole yeah, as far as basic human decency is concerned, right? He yeah, is him, yeah. probably, I mean, nobody's perfect in this yeah, novel, right? But, but he's probably the closest thing to a good guy, like a genuinely good guy. And you Pum Kayan or whatever, however you say Upokin, his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at him, like how he turned out. Yeah, what, ha what happens to Upo Kin? Let's, <laughs> and I think this is actually maybe an interesting place to start. He gets what he wants for like, <laughs> like yeah. three, yeah. three days yeah. or something, and then he, <laughs> he dies. Uh -huh. That's yeah. karma in his funds. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, remember, you know, he is, you know, a. He's not really a practicing Buddhist, right? He does believe that he has time to build a whole bunch of pagodas before he dies, which will. You know, that'll make up for all of the horrible things he's done during his life, right? That'll generate enough good karma that he will be reincarnated um, as, well, not reincarnated as he puts it, as a, a frog or a rat or a woman, right? But yeah, if we look at page 285 at the end of the novel, Upo Kin's rise here, right? Upo Kin realized all his dreams except one. After the doctor's disgrace, it was inevitable that Upo Kin should be elected to the club, and elected he was, in spite of bitter protests from Ellis. In the end, the other Europeans came to be rather glad that they had elected him, for he was a bearable addition to the club. He did not come too often, was ingratiating in his manner, stood drinks freely, and developed almost at once into a brilliant bridge player. A few months later, he was transferred from Kyoktada and promoted. For a whole year before his retirement, he officiated as deputy commissioner. And during that year alone, he made 20,000 rupees in bribes. A month after his retirement, he was summoned to a Durbar in Rangoon to receive the decoration that had been awarded to him by the Indian government. So he gets to join the club, right? He is elected to the club. He gets to treat Europeans as social equals, right? This was the goal. Veraswamy just wanted the, the reflected prestige, right? Was just trying to protect his position. Upo Kin wanted white people to have to treat him as an equal. And he gets that. He gets elected to the club. He gets, afterward, promoted and transferred. And gets even richer through accepting more and more bribes. And it's decorated for his service to the empire. 
It was an impressive scene, that Durbar. On the platform, hung with flags and flowers, sat the governor, frock-coated, upon a species of throne, with a bevy of aides de camp and secretaries behind him. All around the hall, like glittering waxworks, stood the tall, bearded sowars of the governor's bodyguard, with pen and lances in their hands. Outside, a band was blaring at intervals. The gallery was gay with the white inkies and pink scarves of Burmese ladies. And at the body of the hall, a hundred men or more were waiting to receive their decorations. There were Burmese officials in blazing Mandalay pasos, and Indian in cloth of gold padres, and British officers in full dress uniform with clanking sword scabbards, and old Thukis with their gray hair knotted behind their heads and silver hilted daws slung from their shoulders. In a high, clear voice, a secretary was reading out the list of awards, which varied from the CIE to certificates of honor in embossed silver cases. Presently, Upo Kin's turn came, and the secretary read from his scroll. To Upo Kin, Deputy Assistant Commissioner, retired for long and loyal service, and especially for his timely aid in crushing a most dangerous rebellion in Choctaw District, and so on and so on. Then two henchmen placed there for the purpose, hoisted Upo Kin upright, and he waddled to the platform, bowed as low as his belly would permit, and was duly decorated and felicitated, while Ma Kin and other supporters clapped wildly and fluttered their scarves in the gallery. Upo Kin had done all that mortal man can do. It was time now to be making ready for the next world, in short, to begin building pagodas. But unfortunately, this was the very point at which his plans went wrong. Only three days after the governor's Durbar, before so much as a brick of those atoning pagodas had been laid, Upo Kin was stricken with apoplexy and died without speaking again. There is no armor against fate. So, Upo Kin gets all of these rewards for his service to empire, but dies without completing the work that he thinks would give him at least a tolerable afterlife, right? So why do you think the novel structures his life in this way? What has Upo Kin done to get to this point? Why is it that he is able to fulfill all of his duties to empire and retire with honor, but is unable to fulfill his duties to his religion? What's he spent his life in the service of? Apart from himself. Being rich, glory. Yeah, material things, right? But what was what was his path to wealth and glory? What was the vehicle he drove to get there? He lies and cheats his way to get everything. He lies and cheats. But where does all of his power and prestige come from? What is he? What does he do? Who does he work for? The Europeans? Yeah. Who signs his paycheck, right? Who gives him his position? Right. He has worked so hard to advance in the eyes of the colonizer that he's, he loses sight of his own culture and his own cultural roots, right? And by the time he retires and is going to start atoning for the misdeeds he has done in the service of the colonizer, it's too late. He's gone too far and he's dead. So Upo Kien ultimately pays for his betrayal and abuse of his own people, right? 
remembers, I think it's also important to note what it is that he is being decorated for in this ceremony, right? What's, the, what's his action that's specifically mentioned? He stops her at gold. Yeah, for putting down a most dangerous rebellion in Kyoktada district, right? Now, it might be worth noting when we talk about Upokin putting down rebellions, Right. We have two rebellions in the novel, right? In this last part of the novel. Who starts the first one? Who's responsible for the first of these rebellions? Doesn't he start them? Doesn't he start them? Yeah, he starts it, right? He has that conjurer going around with the magic shirts, giving them to the villagers, encouraging them to revolt, saying that you know European bullets can't pierce these shirts. so that he can put the rebellion down himself and become a hero, right? So first rebellion, right? He started it, damn it. What about the second one? What causes the second and more authentic revolt? Um, what's his face? I can't think of his name. Ellis? Uh-huh. He had that, he had, the boy in the face and blinded him or something? Yeah. Ellis hits the boy, hits that schoolboy in the eyes, unprovoked, right? For being cheeky with him. And so, the villagers show up and converge on the club, right? They try to invade the club and they demand Ellis come out and face justice. Now what's happened in between? What's happened between the first rebellion and the second rebellion that had Ellis on edge in the first place? Um, Mr. Somebody died. Um, yeah, very, very minor character, right? The, I can't remember who it was. Um, okay, we have this guy, uh, Maxwell, right? Maxwell. Maxwell helps put down the first rebellion. And he gets a little overeager, right? And he shoots and kills somebody. And if we look on page 225, right? We have here a list of exactly, uh, you know, a list of items that show us exactly how serious this first rebellion is, right? The rebels' entire stock of weapons had been captured. The armory with which, when their followers were assembled, they had proposed to march upon Kyoktada consisted of the following. Item, one shotgun with a damaged left barrel, stolen from a forest officer three years earlier. Item, six homemade guns with barrels of zinc piping, stolen from the railway. These could be fired after a fashion by thrusting a nail through the touch hole and striking with a stone. Item, 39 12 bore cartridges. Item, 11 dummy guns carved out of teak wood. Item, some large Chinese crackers, which are to have been fired in Tororum. Later, two of the rebels were sentenced to 15 years transportation, three to three years imprisonment and 25 lashes, and one to two years imprisonment. So given how pathetic the rebellion was, right, the punishment seems awfully harsh. And one of the Europeans has actually killed somebody. The whole miserable rebellion was so obviously at an end that the Europeans were not considered to be in any danger, and Maxwell had gone back to his camp unguarded. Flory intended to stay in camp until the rains broke or at least until the general meeting at the club. He had proposed to be in, the, in for that, to propose the doctor's election, though now, with his own trouble to think of, the whole business of the intrigue between Upo Kian and the doctor sickened him. So, 
we have a lot then of you know move you know Flory mooning about thinking about Elizabeth and Farrell. Election, that package shows up at the club, right? Page 237. From the moment when the bundle was lifted ashore, they had all known what it contained. It was the body of Maxwell, cut almost to pieces with dods by two relatives of the man whom he had shot. So this is the first time we see any real consequences of European violence, right? Flory and Elizabeth have gone on their shooting expedition and killed, you know, animal after animal after animal, remarking how beautiful the corpses are. <clears throat> and no consequences, right? We've seen Ellis kicking the butler with no consequences. The Lackersteins abusing the butler with no consequences. Right? Flory mistreating Mahlame with no consequences. Now, the pigeons are coming home to roost, right? Violence has erupted to an unacceptable level, and the people of the district are striking back. Right, so they, for, they strike back, for well, one, at the guy who was the offender, right? And also at the guy who was least defended because he was out in the woods by himself. So Maxwell is killed, and this leads Ellis to smack that schoolboy in the eyes, right? Which then leads the people to invade the European club. Now, who's supposed to be putting all of this down? Who's supposed to be in the district for the very purpose of putting this rebellion down? Who wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this stupid rebellion? Upo Kin. Well, Upo Kin, this is his district, right? He lives here, right? Who's the interloper here? Who's been brought in specifically to deal with these rebels? Flory lives here too. Would the honorable Edward Verall? be in Kyoktata at all, if not for these rumors of rebellion. He's there just to lead the military police, right? He's the one who's supposed to be putting this down. What does he spend all of his time doing instead? Flirting. Yeah. Flirting, sort of, right? Does he actually give a crap about Elizabeth? No, it's just there's one attractive young white woman in Kyoktata, and so he spends his time with her, right? What does he spend, what would he be doing if, if there was no Elizabeth, apart from simply ignoring everybody around him? Taking apart his hobbies, clothes, and horses. Yeah, he likes clothes, he likes horses, right? He has those polo ponies he's always riding around. And wasn't he in a lot of debt? Yeah. Right. The Honorable indicates what? The fact that his, his name begins with The Honorable. Does anybody have any idea what this means? Basically, the honorable means that he is minor nobility, right? Minor aristocracy. Right? 
he is born into an aristocratic family, but does not himself have any title, right? He's the younger son. of a wealthy family. Right now, because he has a the honorable in front of his name, this gets Mrs. Lackerstein thinking that this would be a good match for Elizabeth, right? And then suddenly she turns against Flory and tells Elizabeth about Flory's Burmese mistress. Now what's ironic about Mrs. Lackerstein having a problem with Flory having a Burmese mistress? Flory's not anyone honorable or esteemed. It has less to do with Flory and more to do with the Lackersteins, right? Didn't her husband uh, cheat on her? Yeah. With the yeah. Burmese woman or whatever? Yeah, if every time he's out of her sight, he does. Yeah, right? uh, yeah that's why she's <laughs> always with him. Yeah, yeah, she, she has to keep an eye on him to keep him away from alcohol and Burmese women, right? So Mrs. Lackerstein is sort of performing this kind of policing function, right? Keeping her husband away from Burmese women. And she is steering Elizabeth away from Flory because of something that her own husband does, right? Well, really because Edward Verrill is the honorable Edward Verrill, right? But we can get some sense of his attitude towards this place and these people. We look on page 201, 202, right? Verrill was the youngest son of a peer and not at all rich, but by the method of seldom paying a bill until a writ was issued against him, he managed to keep himself in the only things he seriously cared about, clothes and horses. He had come out to India in a British cavalry regiment and exchanged into the Indian army because it was cheaper and left him greater freedom for polo. After two years, his debts were so enormous that he entered the Burma military police, in which it was notoriously possible to save money. However, he detested Burma. It is no country for a horseman. And he had already applied to go back to his regiment. He was the kind of soldier who can get exchanges when he wants them. Meanwhile, he was only to be in Kyoktada for a month, and he had no intention of mixing himself up with all the petty sahi blog of the district. He knew the society of those small Burma stations. A nasty, poodle-faking, horseless riffraff. He despised them. So how does he regard people like the club members in Kyoktada? They're lesser beings, right? I think the, the word horseless is sort of key here, right? These people don't even have horses. They're barbarians. Disgusting. But we see also Elizabeth taking to Verrall in part because of this horsemanship, right? One of her positive memories of her youth, in the few years her family was prosperous, was being sent to a fancy boarding school where she could take horseback riding lessons, right? And so Verrill is able to reintroduce her to the horsey set. All right, they're always going off riding together. Who knows what the hell else they're doing together? Right? Flory certainly has inkling, you know, has, his imagination runs wild about what else they're doing together. But does Verrill seem in any way serious about Elizabeth? No. In fact, he, he flees the station without even saying goodbye, right? Mm -hmm. Once this first rebellion is over, he runs away a few steps ahead of a bill collector. What he really cares about are his horses and not paying his bills. Those are the big things for him. So that's the Honorable Edward Verrill, right? If you look on page 203, right? 
see a little bit of Verrill's history in the army, right? The whiter colonel of the blank rifles was standing near. He flushed to the neck and reported Verrill to the general. Verrill was reprimanded, but the general, a British army officer himself, did not rub it in very hard. Somehow, nothing very serious ever did happen to Verrill, however offensive he made himself. Up and down India, wherever he was stationed, he left behind him a trail of insulted people, neglected duties, and unpaid bills. Yet the disgraces that ought to have fallen on him never did. He bore a charmed life, and it was not the only handle, it was not only the handle to his name that saved him. There was something in his eye before which the Duns, Burra Mimsa heaves, and even colonels quailed. So, so what that Verrill is basically able to get away with whatever the hell he wants. What does this show us about the society in which he operates? Does he operate on anywhere near the same level as the, the Pukka Sahibs in Kyoktada? You're shaking your head now, Brandon? Is this more like that he doesn't want to be there and it's, it just kind of seems like the people there are supposed to revolve around him and that he doesn't mm -hmm. give to crowds. Yeah, are, are they even, is it even that the people are supposed to revolve around him? No, he's supposed to protect. Do, yeah, his duty is to protect and serve, right? Yeah. And he is a commander of military police. But all he wants to do is put in his time, get out of the district, and go someplace where it's easier to ride. Right? Do other people really even seem to exist for him? And the concerns of other people don't matter much to him. Right? He doesn't care how Elizabeth feels about him. He doesn't care that he owes people money. Right? He doesn't care that the train he gets on isn't supposed to leave for another half an hour, right? He makes such an enormous stink about it that the station master just lets the train go. So even a minor aristocrat in these corners, right, these far-flung corners of the British Empire, right, this far away from England, even a minor aristocrat wields an enormous amount of power and has an enormous amount of authority. Right? The general doesn't reprimand him because he's a fellow gentleman. Right? He can do pretty much whatever the hell he wants because of that the honorable in front of his name. People are just going to kowtow to him. And so, he is what dashes Flory's hopes. Now what do you make of sort of what happens to Flory in this final arc of the narrative? And he is supposed to be our main perspective character, right? if it's something that he did himself in his past. Well, <laughs> not faith, but um, karma. Yeah, okay, yeah. So his, his past mistakes. Yes, well, his past mistakes catch up with him, right? So how does he redeem himself in the eyes of the other Europeans? Didn't he stop winning the rebellion? He came out a hero. Yeah, he's the hero of this second rebellion. Right? He's the one who gets out of the, who's, he escapes from the club, gets the military police, and gets them to come and break up. And this, this is actually like really kind of a bizarre and comical scene. All right, let's see, where is the... Better job. 
of the marking pages. Body of policemen, military and civil, about 150 men in all, had attacked the crowd from the rear, armed only with sticks. They had been utterly engulfed. The crowd was so dense that it was like an enormous swarm of bees seething and rotating. Everywhere, one could see policemen wedged helplessly among the hordes of Burmans, struggling furiously but uselessly, and too cramped even to use their sticks. Whole knots of men were tangled Laocoan like in the folds of unruled cadres. There was a terrific bellowing of oaths in three or four languages, clouds of dust, and a suffocating stench of sweat and marigolds, but no one seemed to have been seriously hurt. Probably the Burmans had not used their daws for fear of provoking rifle fire. So the rebels have these sort of machetes that they're carrying that they're not using against the police because the police are just hitting them with sticks and they don't want the police to shoot at them. Right? So no one is actually using the weapons they have at their disposal. It's just fist fight and scuffle. Flory pushed his way into the crowd and was immediately swallowed up like the others. A sea of bodies closed in upon him and flung him from side to side, bumping his ribs and choking him with their animal heat. He struggled onwards with an almost dreamlike feeling, so absurd and unreal was the situation. The whole riot had been ludicrous from the start, and what was most ludicrous of all was that the Burmans, who might have killed him, did not know what to do with him now that he was among them. Some yelled insults in his face, some jolted him and stamped on his feet, some even tried to make way for him as a white man. He was not certain whether he was fighting for his life or merely pushing his way through the crowd. So it's so ingrained in this crowd, right, not to do real violence to a white man, that Flory is able to get through relatively easily, right? For quite a long time he was jammed, helpless, with his arms pinned against his side. Then he found himself wrestling with a stumpy Burman much stronger than himself. Then a dozen men rolled against him like a wave and drove him deeper into the heart of the crowd. Suddenly he felt an agonizing pain in his big right toe. Someone in his boots had trodden on it. It was the military police of Adar, a Rajput, very fat, mustachioed with his padre gone. So when he does finally get injured, it's somebody who's supposed to be on his side who does it, right? It's one of the military police. He was grasping a Burman by the throat and trying to hammer his face while the sweat rolled off his bare bald crown. Flory threw his arm around the Subadar's neck and managed to tear him away from his adversary and shout in his ear. His urdu deserted him, and he bellowed in Burmese, Why did you not open fire? For a long time he could not hear the man's answer. Then he caught it. Hukum neaya, I have had no orders. So, <laughs> the military police don't do anything serious to break up the riot. Why? What are they unable to, what do they seem to be unable to do? Why haven't they shot their guns? They weren't ordered to. No one told them to, yeah. That chain of command is so ingrained, right? That chain of command Don't shoot unless you're told to. Don't open fire unless you're told to. Flory gives the order. Verrall thinks it's damn cheeky of him to do this. When he comes, Verrall's absent here right now, right? He's nowhere to be found. When he comes back, he's pissed off that Flory, um, that Flory told his men to fire, right? But it's interesting, too, that any white man telling them to fire seems to work, right? Mm -hmm. Any white man telling them to fire gets them to do it. Even though Flory is not military, has no military rank. 
in a way, Farrell's right. Flory doesn't have any right to tell them to fire from a technical legal standpoint, right? But I think, yeah, it's, it's just like if we look at sort of like the way authority structures operate in the novel, right? It, it seems to, it seems almost like um, these sort of colonial power structures, these sort of racialized, segregated power structures rob people of agency, right? It makes it impossible for them to act on their own initiative. And that's what's kind of going on here with the military policeman. He won't shoot because no one has ordered him to do it. Now, does Flory's moment of uh, moment of redemption last? Mahua May comes back, right? And breaks into the church service, right? Just as Elizabeth seems to be coming back to him, right? Now that Verrall's out of the picture, Flory suddenly doesn't look so bad anymore. Look on page uh, 270, right? There had been no need to say any more. He had simply taken her by the arms and drawn her towards him. She came willingly, even gladly. There in the clear daylight, merciless to his dis disfigured face. For a moment, she had clung to him almost like a child. It was as though he had saved her or protected her from something. He raised her face to kiss her and found with surprise that she was crying. There had been no time to talk then, not even to say, will you marry me? No matter, after the service there would be time enough. Perhaps at his next visit, only six, week, six weeks hence, the Padre would marry them. So, when we note Flory's disfigured face, right, this birthmark, when does the birthmark appear to be most prominent? Like when, when does he become most self-conscious about the birthmark? Whenever he is feeling ashamed about stuff, I don't know. Yeah, it's usually when he's feeling uh, feeling shame, right? Does he worry about the birthmark at all around uh, any of the Burmese? He really only worries about it when he's around other Europeans, right? He's always trying to turn his face away so they don't see the birthmark. And it tends to flare up. It tend, he tends to become most conscious of it at moments where his Burmese connections become uh, most clear, right? For example, you know, when Mahalame shows up, he suddenly becomes very conscious of his birthmark. Um, you know, when, <clears throat> you know, he's embarrassed with his, over his failure with Elizabeth in the Bazaar, right? He becomes very conscious of his birthmark. So the birthmark, right, the darkening of his skin, you know, the dark spot on his skin, seems to be in some way connected, as we talked a little bit about last time, to his feelings about Burma and his connections to Burma. And here, he is unashamedly displaying it in church in front of Elizabeth, right? It was the first time he had ever risked sitting with his birthmark towards her, right? Here I sit in all of my shame and ugliness, Elizabeth, right? Here is my birthmark, right? Yeah, I've lived in Burma for a while. I've done some stuff. It is what it is. And at the bottom of page 271, he starts thinking about how life with Elizabeth might change him, right? 20 years ago, on, the, on winter Sundays in his pew in the parish church at home, 
He used to watch the yellow leaves as at this moment, drifting and fluttering against leaden skies. Was it not possible now to begin over again as though those grimy years had never touched him? Through his fingers, he glanced sidelong at Elizabeth, kneeling with her head bent and her face hidden in her youthful mottled hands. When they were married, when they were married, what fun they would have together in this alien yet kindly land. Right, so he thinks marrying this English girl will help him turn back time, right? And will erase, will you know, essentially negate all of the time he has spent among Mermans. All the time he has spent out in the colonies, right? She will be a little piece of England in his home, right? A reminder of the home front of the mother country. And yet, why is, why is it important that he unashamedly displays his birthmark for the first time at this moment? What's about to happen to him? His dreams are going to be shattered. Yes, his dreams are going to be shattered by one of these dark things in his past that he's ashamed of, right? Mahlame is going to come in and ruin his peace. She was shrieking like a maniac. The people gasped at her, too, ast too astounded to move or speak. Her face was gray with powder. Her greasy hair was tumbling down. Her long ye was ragged at the bottom. She looked like a screaming hag of the bazaar. Flory's bowels seemed to have turned to ice. Oh, God, God, must they know, must Elizabeth know, that that was the woman who had been his mistress? But there was not a hope, not the vestige of a hope of any mistake. She had screamed his name over and over again. So we've seen over time Mahla May's physical decline, right? Physical changes in Mahla May, right? Um, when we first meet her, when she's still in Flory's good graces, more or less, her face is white with powder like a doll's, right? Then, progressively, the powder fades, right? We see the next time he, he meets her after rejecting her, that the powder doesn't cover like a line across her forehead that shows the brownness of her skin. Then when she accosts him outside the club, she's wearing no powder at all, right? She is fully Berman then in appearance, right? And not made up as a white man's wife. Now here, her face is gray with powder. What does a gray face indicate? Old age, yeah. She's like a screaming hag of the bazaar. Yeah, go ahead. Sickly. Sickly, yeah. A gray face is something we ascribe to, you know, like a dying person or to a corpse, right? She's like a dead thing coming back out of his past to accuse him, right? She looked like a screaming hag of the bazaar. So on the one hand, like she's got full reversion back to um, not just Berman, but lower class Berman, right? She's a creature of the bazaar, not a pampered concubine. And the way she's described is like a monster or like a corpse. Now I think another thing to notice here though is 
how Flory's dog always responds to her when she shows up. Because I think this tells us something about the purpose that the dog, I mean, the dog just seems to kind of appear here and there, right, in the narrative, right? It's mentioned here and there, but it's rarely dwelled on. What does the dog typically do when Mahlame shows up? Flo, hearing the familiar voice, wriggled from under the pew, walked down the aisle, and wagged her tail at Mahlame. The dog's happy to see her. The dog's like, oh, I remember you. Hi. How's it going? The dog, whenever, she's, whenever she and Mahlame are in the same place, The dog wags its tail. When Flory has the dog in the bazaar, right, the dog is curiously poking around into things. And when he's out hunting with Elizabeth, the dog is left with the servant, Kosla, out of sight. So, how might the dog's actions be related to Flory's feelings in some way? This is how are we going on the stretch? His conscience of what he should have done? Mm, is it necessarily what it should I mean, you know, it is just, you know, it's it's a dog, right? It doesn't dogs aren't really capable of complex moral reasoning, was they? I don't think they are my dog doesn't seem to be. Um, is it I think the dog does what Ford wants to do. <laughs> Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, the the dog is usually sort of positive about all things in Burma, right? It wants to dig through the baskets in the bazaar, right? It wants to say hello to Mahlame, right? It does like it reveals Flory's real feelings at various points when he's trying to hide them. Right, particularly when he's around Elizabeth, right? He doesn't want, like, Elizabeth, when they're together in the bazaar, is disgusted by everything she sees, right? Everything's gross. Why would you eat that, right? Why would anyone want these things? The dog wants to poke around and find out, right? The dog wants to smell everything. Which, I guess, if you've ever had a dog, you know, you know that that's just that's something dogs do. They want to smell everything. He wagged, the, the dog wags her tail at Malame because she's happy to see her, right? So yeah, so the dog is showing the self that Flory hides, right? The self that is more kind of embracing towards Burma, that he doesn't want the other Europeans to see most of the time because they make fun of him and call him a bullshit. So then you know, I, I don't want to dwell on this particular scene because again, like, you know, cruelty to animals upsets me. But notice that when Flory commits suicide, right, who does he kill first? The dog. And the I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the dog is the indicator of his love of Burma, right? The dog is the indicator of his feelings about Burma, and so he feels that that's what got him into this mess, and so he kills the dog before killing himself. 
It's not an excuse. I, I, I can't actually, I can never go back and re I can't go back and reread the portion where he kills the dog. It's not able, I'm just not able to do that. But, this is his reasoning, right? This is why I'm miserable. Burma is the reason I'm miserable. Burma is the reason I will never have Elizabeth. Right? Fuck Burma and everything to do with it. Now, <clears throat> when Flory imagines his life with Elizabeth, right, he imagines her playing the piano, right? Yeah. So The piano, for him, represents all that is good and civilized, right? All that is civilized. Now, one thing that you might recall, maybe you don't, uh, from Heart of Darkness is that Kurtz is intended, right, when he meets with, when Marlowe meets there at the end of the novella, is also the, there's a piano in her home, right? She plays the piano. Now, in a colonial novel of this sort, this is actually an important symbol, right? You remember we talked about um, in Heart of Darkness, right? Certain objects uh, like the dominoes. Um, and what was special about the dominoes? Why were dominoes important in that particular novel? The color yeah. The exactly. Color. Yeah. It's an object that is, you know, black within white or white within black, right? A piano is a similar kind of object, right? You have white keys and black keys. And in order to play a piece of music, you have to be able to manipulate both, right? You have to be able to play the white keys and the black keys. So for Flory, right, that mixture of black and white is the mark of high civilization. Now what about Elizabeth? Seventy-eight, right? You should play a piano, he said despairingly. I don't play the piano. What else do we know about Elizabeth's attitudes? She knows like people that are different from her, like the Burmese or whatever. So yeah. I guess she's saying like, is it symbolizing like I don't play the piano and I don't hang around those people? Or yeah, yes, that's exactly where that's going, yes. She doesn't play the piano. She does not mix with the Burmese, right? So, let's just kind of go quickly to the end of the novel, in which you know the characters' various fates are recounted, and we'll go to um, what happens with Elizabeth, page 286, right? As to Elizabeth, things fell out better than she expected. After Flory's death, Mrs. Lackerstein, does everybody get, by the way, that like, Lackerstein is sort of like, lacks restraint? Mrs. Lackerstein, dropping all pretenses for once, said openly that there were no men in this dreadful place, and the only hope was to go and stay several months in Rangoon or Mamio. But she could not very well send Elizabeth to Rangoon or Mamio alone, and to go with her practically meant condemning Mr. Lackerstein to death from delirium tremens. Months passed, and the rains reached their climax, 
and Elizabeth had just made up her mind that she must go home after all, penniless and unmarried, when Mr. McGregor proposed to her. He had had it in mind for a long time. Indeed, he had only been waiting for a decent interval to elapse after Flory's death. Elizabeth accepted him gladly. He was rather old, perhaps, but a deputy commissioner is not to be despised. Certainly he was a far better match than Flory. They are very happy. Mr. McGregor was always a good-hearted man, but he has grown more human and likable since his marriage. His voice booms less, and he has given up his morning exercises. Elizabeth has grown mature surprisingly quickly, and a certain hardness of manner that always belonged to her has become accentuated. Her servants live in terror of her, though she speaks no Burmese. She has an exhaustive knowledge of the civil list, gives charming little dinner parties, and knows how to put the wives of subordinate officials in their places. In short, she fills with complete success the position for which nature had designed her from the first, that of a Burmem Sahib. Why do you think the novel ends with this description of Elizabeth? Why is it the last thing we read? What, were, what did Flory hope regarding Elizabeth? Apart, apart from the fact that she would marry why was he so fixated on marriage to Elizabeth? For England prestige, piece of England. Yeah, a little piece of England, right? Here's an English girl in Burma that he can marry. Yeah, woo -woo. But he also has a number of misconceptions about her, right? Because he, she lived in Paris, he believes that she was, must be bohemian and artistic, right? He believes that she must be civilized and tolerant. But she is none of those things, right? She is, in fact, extremely conventional. Snobbish and unforgiving, right? And what Burma does to someone like Elizabeth, the novel seems to suggest, to suggest, is it accentuates these negative characteristics, right? And this is of a piece with various other European characters in the novel, right? If we look at other Europeans here, right, Burma has accentuated Ellis's tendencies towards racism and violence. It's accentuated Mr. Lackerstein's tendencies towards debauchery. It's accentuated Flory's um, <clears throat> self-destructive tendencies, right? It's made him more wishy-washy and indecisive. Um, It's made him more blind to realities around him. So the basic argument that Orwell seems to make about colonialism, generally, is that it ruins the colonizers. Right? It takes what's already within them, right? what their flaws already are, and amplifies them to the nth degree. Makes them 10 times bigger. At the same time, right, like if we looked at, um, if we look at previous colonialist fictions we've looked at, like uh, Heart of Darkness or The Man Who Would Be King, we see similar things, right? Going out to Africa ruined Kurtz. Going to Kafiristan ruined Drayvot and Carnahan. But was there any sense of reciprocity there? Like, was there any sense that the colonizing mission also ruined the colonized? If we look, for example, at um, Heart of Darkness, do, does the tribe that Kurtz takes over adopt any of his cultural practices? 
that we can see. He becomes absorbed by them, right? He dominates them, but he doesn't give them anything back, right? Draven and Carnahan end up getting devoured as well by the tribes that take over in Firistan. If we look at Upokin and Viraswami in this novel, though, their relationship with the colonizer destroys them as well. Right? Their desire for reflected European prestige also ruins them. Right? Upokin gets ahead in the world. But because in order to do so, he's had to betray his native culture in various ways. He does so um, by destroying his own, so he destroys his own soul as the cost, right? For a Swami's loyalty to the colonizers, in the end, gets him nothing except a demotion and, you know, a rather pathetic attempt to make friends with the one European at the inferior club he is later able to join, right? The Scottish engineer who doesn't care about anything except electrodes. So <clears throat> this is kind of the first novel that we've looked at, you know, and there are some serious problems that I will say that I, I have with this particular novel. I think, you know, it's kind of misogynist. Um, women come out very, very badly. Um, and in fact, seem to be frequently blamed for what's wrong with the men. Um, I think that the caricatures it draws of Indians and Burmans um, are also kind of racist, um, especially if we look at how sort of grotesque their physical appearances are often uh, supposed to be. We have, you know, the, you know, the women's faces like kittens. We have, you know, Upo Kin being so grossly fat with, you know, the bloody looking mouth from chewing on beetle nuts. Um, you know, it's always mentioned, uh, you know, that Viraswami has a pot belly and a fat behind, right? So <clears throat> the tendency to describe native characters in terms of these kind of racist stereotypes and tropes, um, I think is also problematic. But, you know, I mean, I guess the basic uh, the basic issue with this is just how bloody misanthropic it is, right? It's you know it, it everybody looks bad, right? Everybody looks bad at the end of this novel. Like the view of human nature it takes is really uh, rather uh, let's say dim. I don't know. I mean, like, you know, do, do you guys have anything you want to say about this as we close this out, or any questions you want to ask about it? Anything at all? Yes? No, no, that's not. Oh, no. <laughs> I do agree. I think it's kind of, it, it's, it's a dim uh, ending, but I think uh, that, that, I won't say that's a good thing, but mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of is because right. it forces you to kind of, you know, face the fact that, I mean, this was actually, you know, Real. <laughs> sure. Yeah. This was, and, and it's also, I mean, the one positive thing that I see in this is that it does seem to confirm that the whole imperialist project, right, is, is unsustainable, right? This is not a thing that can go on. That this is grinding up everybody that's involved in it. Um, and, you know, when we look at when this is published as well, you know, it's published you know, in the 1930s. This is Orwell's, first, it's not his first book, but it's his first novel. Um, so this is before he'll write more famous things like uh, Animal Farm in 1984, um, which also take relatively dim views of human nature. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, he's also he's writing at a time when the empire is, as we said when we began this, at its greatest physical extent, but is also, as a result of that, starting to unravel from within. Right? There's less support for it at home. The colonies themselves are getting restless um, and more violent. And yet, by 1947, by 13 years after this novel was first published, um, right, British India will no longer exist. It will be divided into four separate independent countries. Well, initially three separate independent countries because Pakistan and Bangladesh began as a single country. Um, but yeah, it will be partitioned and it will no longer be under British rule. Right? And in a lot of ways, the loss of India is the beginning of is the real beginning of the end of the British Empire. So that's what we're seeing here: is the unraveling of the British Empire. All right. Anything else? So this is the last example of colonialist fiction we're going to be looking at. We're going to start um, next time. Uh, Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. So, what the hell is the I'll give you some questions for that. And then once this wakes up, you are free to do as you will. <laughs>